But I do want to say that it's such a great honor and pleasure for me to be here. And indeed, as King said, it is true that I explained to him uh, the reasons why I decided to do biomedical ethics or research ethics, and it was over a glass of wine. The only thing we need to be clear, it was King who was drinking the wine. <laughs> I was drinking something different that was non-alcoholic. I first came to the University of Washington, now close to 22 years ago. And the first time that I came here, I came to study or to take part in the principal's course. It was a very interesting opportunity for me. And then I came back the year after that to start my master's in public health. The University of Washington and I have had a, I would say, a love relationship since then, and I've been privileged to continue to be part of one in one way or another, either research or then later as a faculty member. And if there's one thing that I've learned in the many years that I've been affiliated with the University of Washington, is that when it comes to issues of research, one organization will never be able to do it. And the list of organizations that I'm affiliated with, for me, is just a demonstration and really a recognition that the training that I got at the University of Washington has opened up many, many, many doors for me. And in the many years that I have been part of the University of Washington, one of my, the ways in which I landmark this is my twin sons, who were my last ones, who were then just about three years old. And when you place them on a chair, they couldn't get down themselves. They would ask for help if the chair was high enough. Right now, they are 25, they are taller than me, and uh, chances are that I would be asking them to help me get down from somewhere. <laughs> this is what I hope to share with you this morning to give you a history about research care and training program and the family AIDS care and education services that King has mentioned, which is an HIV care program. Talk about Kenya and the landscape of HIV. Tell you what the FACES response has been and how we've been able to decentralize services. And then link the issues of prevention and treatment, bringing in the question of PrEP that has been answered so capably by the studies that were led by Jared and Kony and that I was privileged to be part of talk about how we've integrated services, and then give you an idea of the other kinds of research that are going on. I will end by talking about some of the challenges that I think are very important for us to be able to address, especially in resource-limited settings, if we're going to be able to continue to expand care and also be able to do research to answer the questions that arise from these places. So let me start with the history of research care and training program. And this history actually goes back to when the University of Washington under King Holmes and uh, Joan Christ then sent Craig Cohen to come in to Nairobi to conduct a couple of studies. They were on pelvic inflammatory disease and HIV. Craig was asked to talk to me by another mentee of King's who was called Alan Ronald. The way that Alan Ronald got to talk to me was because Alan had been part of a collaboration with King that had been engaging both the University of Nairobi and Kemri, the Kenya Medical Research Institute, on issues of research. Alan walked by my door one day. The door had two particular um, posters that I had put on it. And those posters led Alan to knock and to find out who was behind the door. The posters, one of them said, God hates bribery, don't bribe. The second one said, build Kenya, don't bribe. And Alan knocked to find out who was this who was so vehement against bribing in Kenya. When I talked with Alan Ronald, I had just finished um, my studies in obstetrics and gynecology. I was part of a medical research institute. I didn't know anything about research. And I asked him, how would I know that research is the right place for me to be in? He told me, research is like riding a bicycle or like swimming. You can spectate all you like, but you'll never be able to find out if you like it or enjoy it until you get into it. You have to ride a bicycle to know whether you want to ride it. You have to actually get into the water to know if you can be a good swimmer or if you would like swimming. And so he encouraged me to go ahead and do research. He sent Craig to come and talk to me when Craig needed someone to sit in for him for a few weeks when he had to come back to the US. I agreed to sit in for a couple of weeks, not being very sure whether I really did want to work with him or work in the particular area of pelvic inflammatory disease, and the rest is history. 
We've had a long working relationship with Craig, and we set up the research care and training program under which the FACES, Family AIDS Care and Education Program, falls as our care arm. We've had the opportunity to be able to mentor many people during this process. Craig, if I may mention, was also one of, of King's mentees. And currently, we have over 1,200 individuals working in various capacities, both in care and in programs. So what do the three arms of RCTP, Research Care and Training, stand for? The first is research, because primarily we were interested in HIV prevention research. But in the process of doing HIV prevention research, as I will mention shortly, we realized we had to also expand care. The second one is care. That is where FACES come in, comes in, the Family AIDS Care and Education Services, because we're providing care to individuals who may have come in for screening because they wanted to get involved in the HIV prevention, service, uh, HIV prevention research, but because they were positive, they could not participate. And thirdly, training. We've had to capacity build, not just for those who are interested in research, but even for those who are expanding care. And I'll tell you a little bit in a short while how we got into the area of care to start off with. This is our Nairobi administrative offices. And then within Kisumu, we have a number of different facilities. I thought King was going to tell you the story, but since he didn't, let me tell you about it. The, when we started working in Kisumu, that's an area that's near Lake Victoria, we actually just had a patch of grass. There was nothing else on it. And this first building was actually put up by funds that were, uh, were from the couples intervention studies that we did earlier on. But our care studies required us to also be able to have a building to house the work that we're doing in expanding care. The challenge was, however, PEPFA funds cannot be used for any building. You can't put up a building. However, you can renovate. So King was very creative, and he was able to get funds for us to put up a slab, which was a foundation. And then using PEPFA funds, we're able to renovate the slab <laughs> and put up a building. We've also been able to expand care in other areas and been able to leverage funding. For example, this is a center within Kisumu as well, and we were doing the early microbicide studies on women, the, the, the piverin ring and the, the piverin gel, because the young women coming to the clinic were not comfortable coming into a place, a public health setup, where they may be able to meet relatives or other people they know. So we needed to provide a place that was a little more private for them. But we've also been very fortunate in levering funding, not just for renovations, but actually putting up new buildings, like the Kisumu County Referral Hospital Comprehensive Care Center that was put up entirely with funds we're able to generate from uh, philanthropic donors. In other areas, it's just been a question of renovating, painting roofs, providing water tanks, or any other infrastructure that might have been needed. The research didn't get left behind either, because sometimes we didn't have space to be able to do actual research. And so what we did was ensure that we could leverage funding to be able to put up structures, like when we're working with the International Partnership for Microbicides, looking at the incidence of infections in the Suba area, we were able to put up this building. Now let me explain a little bit about how we went into HIV care, because I want to turn our attention to Kenya and HIV. In the early years of the epidemic, there was no treatment. Anytime you give someone a diagnosis of being HIV positive, it was like a death sentence. And indeed, many people deteriorated rather fast. And when they were ill, the best that we could do for them was provide home-based care and testing, which means we tried to give them dignity, tried to offer them as much comfort as we could, knowing very well that they were going to die within a period of time. One of the young women who made a difference to me, and some of you have heard me say this story in the past, was a young woman whom I will call Susan. Susan was diagnosed with HIV, and she deteriorated very rapidly in the process of care. At this time, there was so much stigma that even the nurses and the doctors would isolate patients who had HIV and would literally not want to go into the room where they were isolated. Now, Susan was literally on her deathbed, and I asked her at one point in time what she would want, what she would wish for. I imagine Susan was going to tell me that she wished there was treatment for HIV, or there was a cure, or that there was a vaccine that could be developed, something really high and lofty. What Susan told me has really haunted me over the years. Susan told me that she really wished she could eat a meal, enjoy the meal, and feel full. 
At that time, Susan had so many sores in her mouth that she couldn't chew anything. It was too painful. And even the porridge that they fed her would come out straight the way that it went in. Susan was one of those who were never able to save. She did pass away shortly. But for me, it was a turning point because it reminded me that beyond doing research on HIV prevention, we could not keep away from HIV care. So what's the concern about HIV in Kenya, the country that I was born in and that I continue to live and work in? We have almost 2 million people who are infected. Remembering that my background is an obstetrician gynecologist, it's always been my concern, and this is what has really driven me. The infection in women is much higher than that in men, and we have many more women affected much, much earlier. So the face of HIV remains a young African woman. And as you can see, women are infected much more than men. Kenya is a country of diverse epidemics, and in different cities, in different counties now, we have different epidemics. The first bars that you see there, those are the areas that we have been working in. And we specifically relocated our work from Nairobi, where we initiated the work, to the area around the lake to target places where the epidemic was hardest hit. So what has been our FACES response? PEPFAR was a game changer. Because with support largely from PEPFAR and other donors and other foundations, we've been able to make a difference. We've been able to provide universal access to individuals by the year 2010. We chose what we call a family-centered, comprehensive, compassionate care model. And we've been able to capacity build for ensuring not only are we offering care, but even if the technical assistance we provide was removed, the service providers on the ground would be able to continue it. The question you may ask is, so what is family-centered care? It means when we identify an individual who's HIV positive, we also test all the individuals around them, family members, their partners, children, and it ensures that we can also provide appointments for families so that someone doesn't have to come to clinic one day and then find resources to bring another family member on a different day. They can all come in together. It also provides opportunities for disclosure and for support for the individual who's taking treatment. Using this same model, we've been able to ensure that we can provide prevention of parent-to-child transmission within the program that we've been able to run. We provide HIV counseling and testing. We've been able to put people on highly active retroviral treatment. We do TB screening and treatment as part of the program, recognizing that these individuals do need reproductive health services. This is something we've also been able to provide, and also ensuring that we can support adherence and retain people in care. We've also been able to expand the laboratory services so that we're able to provide these as is needed. And for some of the ailing participants, we've been able to provide food by prescription to enable them to improve their nutritional status. We encourage positive uh, pre prevention with those who are positive by giving counseling and ensuring that they understand their infectiousness and what they can do to protect others and have also expanded the provision of voluntary male medical circumcision to anybody who wants it. Part of the program that we've been able to do also ensures that we can provide counseling and psychosocial support to the individuals who are accessing care. The facilities we work in range from those that are very, very rural and very, very rustic, and sometimes to partnerships like this one with the Tungane Youth Center that we have been able to do with another um, individual who was an, who is an alumni of uh, the University of Washington, Dr. Kawango Agot, who has been running an NGO that's called Impact Research and Development Organization that has been targeting youth. And together, we've been able to work on this Tungane Youth Center to be able to ensure that we can provide a youth-friendly environment that en encourages the youth to come in, get tested, initiate them on treatment, because young women were a challenge in being able to get them initially just because of concerns around stigma. They had a girls only day where they encouraged young women and even those with children to come in and bring, get tested, bring their children in to get tested, providing them with a comprehensive compendium of different services that they would need. The FACES arm was really to provide technical support, 
capacity building, ensure they had appropriate laboratory services, and then continuing joint CME to build capacity for the Tungane town. So as part of our rapid decentralization, it meant we needed to take care as close as possible to those who need it. Travel, challenges with having finances are often a barrier for people being able to access care. And this schema just shows what we're able to do between 2005 to 2007. Expanding care from places where there was very little care available to ensuring that literally within walking distance, one was able to go and access services. In some places, it was a comprehensive set of services. In other places, it may have been more minimal care. And indeed, this has been able to make a difference because we have been working even in areas where there are islands, which are more remote, more difficult to access, and where we didn't have treatment initially. One of the stories that I've always remembered based on these particular working on the islands was an island where we didn't have any facility. And we would send in our service providers two to three times a week. They needed to go by boat very early in the morning. The lake gets much, much rougher in the evenings than in the morning. But in order to provide services, we needed to rent space. The only space that was available was a bar. Because during the morning, there were no clients. And so they made this bar available. At night, when they were busy, our health workers would be sleeping in a corner, or at least trying to sleep and then waiting to catch the next early morning boat in the morning because it's usually inadvisable to try and catch the boats in the evening. That's when most calamities and accidents happen. I'm happy to say that the place in which we initially used to run services by a bar, you know, in the bar, we've been able to build not only a health facility, but also been able to build healthcare workers' houses so that people are now stationed there, sent by the Ministry of Health. So what about prevention and treatment and why am I talking about prevention is also being part of something that is really important. I think it's important to always remember that in order to turn the tap off, we can't always talk about just treatment alone. We need to ensure that we are stopping those who are getting infected from getting infected and providing care for those who are infected for us to be able to really have a handle on this epidemic. In particular, our family-centered approach has ensured that we can find children who actually need to be provided with care because we'll have another whole generation of individuals who can then grow up HIV-free, and that is part of the co-prevention mandate. King has already mentioned this study that I know you are all aware of, and Cody, who's here, was one of the key people. And happily, we were able to show that indeed a pill a day does keep HIV away and also be able to demonstrate even further that beyond that, indeed, even in the real world setting, it really does work. I want to use this as a segue to talking about another large study, and then I'll roll in the issue of PrEP and how PrEP fits into the larger schema of things. When you're providing care, the question has always been, how can we reach the UNAIDS targets of 90, 90, 90? What's the most effective way of being able to test link into care, treat, and retain. Search, Sustainable East African Research Search for Health, is a study that has been in the field now for the last three years. It's led out of UCSF by Diane Havler, and I am the Kenyan site PI. So what are we trying to answer? This is one of the, I believe there were four or five large studies that were trying to look at the issue of population control of HIV, and the question was, can we find a strategy that can really shut down new infections by finding all those who are infected, giving them the opportunity to be linked into care, providing them with the treatment that they need? Is there a way that we can also show that this would be useful because it means that people can stay productive longer? Let me add the caveat that when we started the search study, universal test and treat had not been implemented. And the search data was part of what provided that information around the usefulness of universal test and treat. The question was also, how do you do it? Recognizing that there are minimal resources, what's the best way of being able to do it? And beyond just testing for HIV, because often there still is stigma about testing, can we utilize models that looks at a chronic care disease model? So it's not just HIV we are testing for. People want to be screened for diabetes or for hypertension 
or for other things that may be of more concern to them. So search has been implemented in 32 communities. Each community has 10,000 individuals in two sites in Uganda and in one site in Kenya. And we're really testing a multi-disease population-based model using a streamlining care strategy that's supposed to help us reduce HIV incidence and improve the overall health of any given community. How do we do it? We take testing as close as possible to the individuals who need to be tested. We provide what we call community health campaigns where individuals can come in and get screened for HIV, get screened for hypertension and diabetes and malaria or whatever other concerns that they might have. Use this as an opportunity to immediately link those who are tested positive into care and use this also as a mechanism for providing prevention <coughs> messages for those who are negative. So when we started with our first phase, the goal was to have these 32 communities, 16 that were randomized to intervention and 16 that were randomized into control. And in the, in the control arm, we simply used the standard of care that was available at that point in time. At that point in time, there was guidance around CD4 counts, first 350 and then later on moving to 500. In our intervention arm, we tested and immediately initiated people on care. And I will be sharing the results with you shortly just to be able to show we have been able to hit the UNAIDS 1990 targets. We are however moving to a new phase because using the current standard of care, everybody who's tested and tests positive is provided the opportunity to be able to initiate care. And this is where PrEP comes in. What our new intervention now is, is the opportunity for those in the intervention arm to be offered PrEP so that we can see what kind of, prep, what kind of uptake is there and whether people are able to utilize it as may be appropriate. We provide it in two different ways. We provide the opportunity for someone who self-evaluates uh, uh, self and feels they're at risk, but we also have a model that we walk people through to be able to try and identify their risk. We're also testing, do people want to have PrEP delivered to them in community centers that are close to them, or do they want to come into the health facility to be able to get this? So our goal of reaching 90% testing in as far as the population is concerned, we take a census of every single individual who is living within that community. And then we run a community health fair or community health campaign for two weeks and be able to see how many individuals come into the community health fair to be tested. And then we follow up because we do know everyone who's in the community. Those who do not come in, we follow them with home-based testing to still provide them with the opportunity to get tested. Out of the 132,000 individuals who we tested, 37% were new infections of individuals who had not been aware of their HIV testing. Testing coverage included 90% of testing of individuals, stable residents of that particular community, women more than men, and mostly people were willing to come to the community health fair. 20% we had to go to find them in their homes. The Ugandans were much more willing to come to the community health fair compared to the Kenyans. And please don't ask me why. We've also been able to reach the adolescents that have been a group that's difficult to reach. And even more importantly, we've also been able to reach the children, those in between two to nine years of age. And we had 81% testing coverage, and half of these were a new diagnosis of HIV. This is an example of a heat map. The first community on the left. Nyamristra is in Kenya, Nyamkoma is in Uganda, and the last one on this side, Nyakoto is also in Kenya. When you look at the areas that are red and areas that are orange and yellow, those are individuals who do not know their HIV testing. That's at baseline. In the middle schema, you can then see immediately after we had finished a community health campaign, the numbers change because people get to know their status. You can see the Kenyans are a little bit more reluctant. They don't come to the community health care campaigns as well. But by the time we finish with the home-based testing, we've literally covered everybody and people are aware of their HIV status. So how have we tried to make it as easy? We've used five different steps. One, we start ART immediately. We ensure that we can have a triage by nurses or other workers to make sure clinic visits are as swift and as painless as is possible. 
for many of these individuals who are largely well and not exhibiting any symptoms, they want to spend the minimum amount of time they can in the clinic. We've used a patient-centered approach where we have a welcoming environment. We're able to foster trust and a sense of investment in the particular patients. We try to be flexible in the clinic hours, especially for the fishing communities that tend to keep broader order hours. And then we've had a tiered tracking mechanism of trying to track those who have not been able to come back. And because we use a multi-disease care model, it has helped reduce the stigma because people feel they don't really know what someone is coming in to care for. We've been using the telephone hotline to make it easy for access. Patients are able to flash. They call, but you don't, you know, they don't wait for you to pick. We call them back to make sure they can make appointments, we can engage, and if they have questions, that we are also able to answer. Again, using technology, we're able to remind people about appointment times and appointment dates and ensure that they can come back into clinic. The last strategy, which has really been key, is using what we call viral load testing. Because we do test viral loads right from the beginning, we're able to use this as a mechanism to talk with the patients so that they are aware. What, how are they doing in terms of their adherence? by talking to them about their viral load and viral load suppression over a period of time, so that they also have a goal of trying to ensure that their viral load is undetectable. So we've been able to follow up this on baseline going all the way up to year three. And we've been able to look at what the costs are, to calculate what the population viral load is, and be able to look at what is the cascade in terms of our being able to provide care. So these are the next two slides really are at the heart of the matter in being able to show the first set right on the left. The percentage of patients with prior HIV diagnosis that were able to reach in terms of being able to provide to test and then the viral suppression at the beginning was only 70%. By year one and then by year two, we're able to achieve 97% viral suppression. In this middle one here, those ones were those who are, so the first ones were people who had never been diagnosed with HIV at all. They didn't even know their status. The middle one were those who had been diagnosed and had been on ART. At that point in time, we had about 80% suppression of those individuals who had already been aware of their HIV status, but were able to get their viral suppression all the way up to 94%. If we combine those two, anyone who had ever been on ART or any, those we diagnosed immediately, and those who had been on treatment earlier, again, starting with 86% overall viral suppression, that includes individuals who had never known, been aware, had not, not been on treatment, just starting with what the baseline viral load was, we've been able to achieve over 90% in terms of our targets. This exceeds what UNAID has set in terms of the, uh, the third 90, because if you look at the cascade for UNAIDS at 90, 90, 90, the third 90 actually results in a 73% suppression, which we have been able to demonstrate you can go beyond that. It's really about ensuring we can simplify the way that people get ARBs. They're able to get it at a place which is convenient for them and to understand why it is they're taking the meds and to provide them with the support they need. Let me shift back to faces and just be able to show you how we're able to cascade within a very short period of time the number of clinics and facilities that were providing care for individuals in the regions that we're working in. We have been working in the last nine years, Nairobi, Kisumu, Suba, these are all the subject districts that we're working in, and just being able to show the kind of care sites we've been able to initiate and the ART sites. Remember that this was before we had universal test and treat. So there were places in which we were offering just opportunistic infection treatment and places where we were actually providing heart. Let me shift towards integration of services. Again, it's recognizing that when we integrate services, people are able to reduce stigma, we're able to share resources with the other service providers, and then we can fold HIV into the other service departments. This comprehensive care center that's in Suba and Sindo was one of the sites that we were able to build with donations from philanthropic donors. And using these facilities, we've been able to indicate what are the benefits of integrating HIV care into the primary health care services? We've also been able to look at issues of antenatal care and whether HIV services can be integrated into antenatal care. And lastly, looking at issues around really prevention of mother-to-child services within the MCH 
environment. It's recognizing that we need to be able to understand the best way to meet the family planning needs of HIV infected women, recognizing this is the first pillar. If women are helped not to get pregnant when they don't even want to, then we're already prevention, preventing parent to child transmission. And this information has been useful for informing program makers on the best way to go. Stigma is one of the concerns and remembering that I said that women are infected more than men in the communities we've been working with. And many of these women, because of disempowerment, have had challenges with being able to disclose. So one of the studies that we looked at was the issues of stigma and how this impacts on antenatal care attendance and choices. We recognized on the basis of this study that those who are living with HIV can really make a difference. And so we have incorporated the people who are living with HIV as part of our care program. Peer educators who are enrolled onto the program are largely individuals who are living with HIV. And we learned that when they share their stories, they're able to improve the uptake of our services. Just one person or a couple of people sharing their stories was able to increase the uptake of testing among women from 77 to 87%. As I finalize, what other studies have we been able to do on this platform of care that we had created? Cervical cancer remains a major concern, and this is one of the things that we've been able to look at over the period of time. How do we best treat women with HIV who we maybe we test and find may have cervical cancer? It's been an opportunity to also build capacity by training healthcare providers in being able to provide this service. One of our key innovations was the ULISA hotline. ULISA is a word in Kiswahili that means ask. People who are in remote care settings have challenges sometimes in initiating uh, patients on care because they're not sure or if they have a question, they will hesitate. The ULISA hotline that has now been taken up by the National Government Service is an opportunity for those who are in remote settings to be able to call in and have an expert physician provide them with answers or provide them with solutions for any challenges they're experiencing in providing care. I want to finish off by talking about a few other studies we've done. Food insecurity is one of the concerns of many people living with HIV. If they do not have food, they find it hard to be able to take their treatment. And so we have, I had done a pilot study and we're currently conducting a larger randomized clinical trial that's looking at if we are able to provide a small loan that gives agricultural inputs and provides farmers or people living with HIV who have farmland and have access to water with an opportunity to be able to plant and grow crops. This has a twofold effect. It's able to provide them with the food that they need, but it's also able to provide them with crops that they can sell as an income and improve their overall likelihood. And our target will be to be able to see how much viral suppression we're able to see as a result of this intervention. Other ongoing studies that I'll just mention are issues around fertility desires for either couples who are discordant or couples who are HIV positive, issues around adapting issues of gender violence and how to deal with it in the context of the HIV positive individuals we take care of. We've been looking at ways of being able to enhance the clinical skills and effects of to provide infant feeding solutions for women who are living with HIV, and also looking at concerns around family health and family health planning and providing knowledge to the women living with HIV. Finally, some of the challenges, because no matter how well you do, there are always concerns. I hope you can see that in this, one of the challenges is, that is actually a vehicle that is stuck in the mud and we needed cows to pull it out of the mud that it was in. So it's reverse technology. <laughs> Changing regulatory environments have been a concern because this is something that changes and you need to be able to keep up with it. Differing custom requirements, and just yesterday someone was mentioning to me about goods that have been stuck at customs in Kenya for studies that they're trying to do. There were mechanisms of providing waivers where VAT would not be required for medical supplies. That system no longer exists. Kenya now requires VAT payment for everything. If you have a US government funded project where VAT is not allowable as a cost to use, then you end up with a challenge. You have goods that can't reach the country, and you have a challenge because you can't pay the money that you may have for your research grant. Bureaucratic procurement processes, both in Kenya and here, have been a challenge. 
and sometimes just differing qualities of the standards that are expected in the process of implementation. Funding delays have been a challenge, and sometimes it takes quite a bit of time before the money can get onto the ground. One typical challenge we constantly feel or constantly experience is the issue of when you're a sub-recipient and you get a contract that says it's cost reimbursable, but the country doesn't have institutions that have enough money to be able to front the costs and then get reimbursed. So if the subcontract comes without an advance, you're stuck. You have a signed subcontract, you have no money and you can't move it ahead. Infrastructure remains a constant concern, upgrading, improving, and we do not have the state of the lab facilities that I see here. This also leads to challenges with data management and technology. And again, like in an institution like Cambria where I work, we have not had a dedicated grantmanship office that is as skilled and as developed as the Office of Sponsored Research that I see in many of the US universities. And without that kind of dedicated support, it's very difficult for scientists or even those who are working in programs to be able to apply for and be successful in getting these grants. I want to finish off by just talking about concerns. Many of the participants we serve, many of the individuals who are involved in the research that we do, they're not the individuals who are well healed. They may have some level of education, but they're not the highest level. I can say I've never had anybody with a PhD come and volunteer in any of the research studies that I have been part of. And often the women also have diminished autonomy and may not be able to make some decisions. This is always a concern that we need to keep at the front of our minds. Politics does play a role, and I know politics is a sensitive topic, so I won't talk about US politics. I will purely stick to the Kenyan politics. And political instability that happens, especially for us, round about election time, and this is an election year for us, often destabilizes programs and makes it very difficult for us to be able to implement. I want to finish off by sharing a poem that I learned in high school well before I knew that I would ever be a researcher. At that point in time, I was still aspiring to go to medical school, but I always thought that I would probably do pediatrics. We were made to learn this poem as part of our literature classes. It was written by a young woman. She was young then, now she is actually deceased. She was from the Western world. She got married to a Kenyan who had gone to study abroad and came back to live in Kenya. And this poem depicts a young woman who has very limited opportunities for education, very limited resources. Atieno. Atieno is a very common name from around the lake region where we work. And Atieno ends up getting pregnant at a very early age. Atieno dies of postpartum hemorrhage and leaves behind a young child who will likely have the same cycle of poverty, poor health. My sadness has been that while this poem was written, 50 years ago when Kenya was just getting their independence. Today, Atieno is still in Kenya. Atieno would still have the same challenges. The only sadness is Atieno would also get infected with HIV in the process of everything else that she has to face. And my hope is that together we can continue to make a difference to the lives of Atieno and that her daughter, whom she leaves behind, will not face the same cycle that she has had. Thank you very much for your attention and the opportunity to talk to you. Please ask me difficult questions that I can deflect to King. <laughs> It may be interesting for this group to think that we, our university president is making a big investment uh, of the university in what is being called population health. And what Elizabeth has described is population health. Tell us about this telephone system that seems to be working so well. Thank you. The telephone system, the Uliza hotline, has a clinician manning it, and usually the clinician is someone who 
is experienced an infectious disease trained person or someone who has really been trained and has worked over a period of time in the field of HIV. So it's manned 24 hours. What happens is the clinician who's at the other end of it, the line is made available. We distribute information and let people who are providing care know that there is this hotline they can call. They don't have to call, they flash, and then we call back. We walk them through the process. They talk about whatever challenge they're having or whatever the patient has or whatever struggle they may be having, either with the signs or the symptoms or the diagnosis or the actual treatment. And then the expert physician provides them, walks them through the process and provides them with guidance so that they can actually implement. And then we have an evaluation. We follow up. For all the calls, we look at how many people called, what kind of training do they need, what kind of questions are they having. And also, we're able to follow up to see, did they implement the advice that they had been given, and how is the patient doing thereafter? It's now become a national program. The National AIDS Control and STD program, that's at the national level at the Ministry of Health, has actually taken up the program from us, and now it's a countrywide program. So it's no longer in our control. It was one of the best practices, but they actually took it up. So now it's provided on a wide basis, both as a telephone service, and then with AMREF, the African Medical Research Foundation, they've also been able to institute an online service where people who want to ask questions online or send information on the internet can also access that program. Elizabeth, thank you for a great talk. Um, where, what is the current status, for Kenya in particular, of uh, dependency on external funding, PEPFAR fundings, and how do you see that uh, playing out over the next five to ten years? We're still very, very dependent on PEPFAR and the Global Fund for providing the majority of funding that's coming in to care for people living with HIV. Kenya has talked about and has initiated, and it's a really small fund, to be able to have what they're calling a revolving fund that comes in from our own taxes to be able to grow it over a period of time. But it's very nascent as of now. If funding dramatically changes in terms of a Global Fund or PEPFAR, then indeed we will we will we'll have a shortfall. It will be very difficult. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you for a terrific talk. It's really impressive and inspiring. I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about the search project and where you've made the, I think, the, one of the first large-scale programs, really, that have hit those targets. So have you been able, two, two parts to the question. First is, have you been able to demonstrate that as ARV uptake and viral suppression increased, that stigma went down? And then secondly, could you talk a little bit more about the PrEP component? Because it seems like if, in fact, stigma about taking medications is lower in this setting, this might be the kind of ideal situation where there would be high uptake and acceptance of ARVs for prevention as well. So with the stigma, I think there are two things that have reduced the stigma. One, I think it's not just the issue around the HIV testing, it's the multi-disease model. So when people are coming in and getting tested or going into clinic, they feel like, you know, you don't know what it is that I'm going in for. Could be HIV, could be hypertension, could be anything else. And the integration of care within the healthcare facilities has also helped because everybody's sitting in the same queue. It's no longer stigmatized. That's where you go to if you're HIV positive and with everything else, you go to this other place. So that integration, I think, has helped reduce that. The other thing has, that has contributed to that aspect is individuals who have HIV who are willing to be vocal and talk about it. And when people have seen their health turn around, individuals who are really emaciated and were struggling and are able to get back and go into work and are able to talk about it, that has also helped reduce stigma a lot. In as far as PrEP is concerned, this is a good setup. It's early days yet because we are in the first year of implementation of PrEP, so we are not able to really be able to uh, say what it is that people uh, want and what it is that people are interested in using, which of the two models and how much uptake. We haven't quite gotten to the point of evaluating, but indeed there has been quite a lot of uptake in terms of PrEP. So people are interested, they want it. And I think, again, our family-based model of having the whole family come in has been a, a key part of being able to help an HIV-negative person within a discordant couple be able to make that choice. And we've had people who say, well, you know, I remind him to take his drugs and he reminds me to take mine. And again, we're emphasizing that PrEP is not for life. It's for that season. But indeed, the disclosure and the support has been very helpful. Elizabeth, that was terrific. Thank you so much. Um, you touched on the, the um, use of the PEPFAR platform to begin to address 
chronic non-communicable diseases, which is something that is being championed in a lot of uh, places right now, including through NIH, and actually is relevant here in this country as well. What are you finding as the major barriers to, to doing that? What are some of the challenges you're encountering as you try to bridge from the, plat the PEPFAR platform to address cardiovascular disease, cancer, uh, mental health issues, you know, the chronic disease? If I was to talk about the challenges we're experiencing specifically as a team, I think it's again, our initial focus was very much around HIV, STDs, and we've built capacity in that area. We need to build a whole nother capacity in the area of chronic diseases because we do not necessarily have individuals who have been interested or specialized in that area and who are able to take up that opportunity, whether it's grant writing, whether it's finding opportunities to embed that into our work. So a lot of our people we've trained, mentored, are really focused on reproductive health, STIs, HIV. You need a whole nother expertise be able to be dealing with issues of chronic renal disease, the epidemiology part they may have, but the actual clinical expertise. So that's a whole other stream we need to develop in terms of chronic diseases and in terms of cancers. Thank you so much. You talked in the beginning a bit about your capacity building efforts. Can you talk more about how you've integrated those and into the work that you described and what needs to happen or what is happening to ensure the sustainability of all the amazing programs you described? That's a good question. Let me start with the question about how we've done the capacity building. Apart from in-house, on-the-ground training and mentoring, there's also the question of advanced training. And I see that the person with the mic who's going to ask next is Carrie Farquhar, and I have the privilege of being able to co-direct a training program with her, <coughs> HIV and women. And right now we had one scholar come in last year, two who are here now, both long-term and short-term training in terms of building capacity for the next generation. So it's been targeted, it's been specific. Sometimes it's been things that are in-house, but it's also been opportunities. And again, it's been looking at where are the areas where we need capacity built. One of the areas that I did mention was regulatory, research regulation. And this has been a concern for me because if you don't have strong research regulation systems, it's very hard to get research done. There's a, a Fogarty training grant for research capacity building that we have applied for severally. I think for the first time this year, I have hope. They told, sent me a very nice email saying, congratulations, but you're not funded yet. Uh, this is just for planning and notifying you that you know, we are considering funding you. So maybe if we do get funded in that area, that would be another area of <laughs> capacity building. So we've been targeting specific training grants that are able to ensure we can capacity build in specific areas. In terms of longevity, that's a question I've been asked several times. How do you ensure sustainability? I think sustainability isn't money in the pocket. Sustainability is individuals who are trained have the capacity. The way you build sustainability is individuals who can keep applying for grants, individuals who have the capacity, the interest, the enthusiasm, the ideas, and who are willing to do the research or implement the programs to make a difference. So, so long as we are ensuring that it will not end with us, there are other individuals who can take over, something that I think King has really done very well. I think we don't need to worry about sustainability. It's in the human beings, in the capacity. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, that, that actually was addressing a lot of what I was going to ask you about, which is how can the University of Washington continue to collaborate, partner, and really support what the wonderful work that you're doing most effectively? What, what do you see our role in training, capacity building, uh, both on the research as well as on the clinical side? I think for me, there are three key areas that I would want to mention. In terms of um, epidemiology, there's been a whole, I think we have a critical mass that's been trained now. It's a question of them moving forward and making a difference in the areas that we work in. But there are three areas that I think haven't really been well addressed so far. One is the area of chronic diseases. That was the question that I was being asked, because we haven't really built capacity in that area of research, whether it's cancers, whether it's hypertension, renal diseases, that aspect has been a little bit neglected. The second area is research regulation, where I think we still need a lot of capacity building. And part of the frustration that investigators sometimes feel, you have to submit to more than one IRB, they're different, the way in which they work are different, the capacities are different. And unless the in-house or in-country IRBs are brought on par, 
were they able to understand the regulations in a different way, be able to have the capacity to triage and determine what goes into full review, what doesn't, what's minimal risk, what isn't, then that frustration will always remain. That's the second one. The third area is research administration, which is an area which I think has been completely neglected. There was the assumption that things would happen, but happen somehow. But if you don't have research administration capacity, it's very hard to be able to do the work. Supplies get stuck, money doesn't move in an appropriate manner, accounting for the money, for the resources becomes a challenge. And I think there needs to be capacity building in that area of research administration, because that is where the bottleneck will be for being able to administer. You have the people who can work, who are interested, who will get the grants, but then after that, it's a frustration to be able to administer it. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Bacuzzi.